October 21st, 2016. Something strange started happening across the internet. Security blogs went dark. Connections failed. Pages timed out. Entire websites just disappeared. Twitter, Netflix, Reddit, Spotify, just gone. It didn't start with a government or a foreign cyber division. It started in a dorm room with three kids playing Minecraft. What they built wasn't meant to destroy anything, at least not at first. They just wanted to win, to flood their rivals, to corner a market. But what they unleashed was something far bigger, an invisible network built from security cameras, routers and baby monitors, devices nobody ever thought of as dangerous. And when their tool was set loose, it didn't just slow things down. It brought everything to a stop, and it proved something terrifying. That ordinary tech could be turned into a weapon. Not by a government, not by a cybercrime syndicate, but by three kids. What did they build that was powerful enough to break the internet? And how did a game of Minecraft turn into digital warfare? Late 2015. It started in a dorm room with three kids, Paris Jaw, Josiah White, and Dalton Norman. Three monitors, endless caffeine, one obsession, Minecraft. They weren't hackers, not yet. Just teenagers, coding, tweaking, fighting for control of virtual worlds. But behind the pixelated blocks and diamond swords was real money. Minecraft wasn't just a hobby. It was a marketplace. Thousands of players, thousands of servers, each one competing for uptime, traffic, and reputation. Paras ran one of them, a Minecraft server, custom mods, loyal players. But the bigger it got, the more it got attacked. DDoS attacks, distributed denial of service. Competitors would flood his IP with junk traffic, crashing the server, kicking off players, ruining everything. No uptime, no players, no revenue. So, Paras pivoted. He started learning how the attacks worked, how to defend against them, and how to launch them. And from that obsession came a business, Protraf Solutions, a DDoS mitigation service, protection for game servers, built by someone who knew exactly how to break them. But protection was only part of the picture. Behind the scenes, Paris was building something else. He brought in Josiah, a coder who understood network traffic like it was second nature. Then Dalton, younger, but with a knack for automating what others did manually. Together, they started writing scripts. First, simple ones. Floods, pings, connection killers. Then bigger ones, smarter ones. But scripts weren't enough. Not if they wanted to take over the scene. Not if they wanted to dominate. They needed something larger, something distributed, something that could overwhelm anything on command. So they went hunting, not for computers, not for servers, for something easier. They scanned the internet for forgotten devices, cameras, routers, baby monitors, all connected, all vulnerable. Factory logins like admin slash admin, no firewalls, no updates, no oversight. And once they got in, they didn't need to steal data. They just dropped a small piece of code, a recruiter, a worm, a silent soldier, each device now under their control. They called it Mirai, Japanese for future. And Mirai didn't sleep. Each infected device scanned the web for more victims. And everyone it found joined the swarm. It grew fast. Tens of thousands of bots across countries, continents, time zones. With a single command, Perez and his crew could launch a flood so big, it would knock almost anything offline. And they used it. First, to target rival Minecraft hosts, take down competitors, steal their players, boost their own business. Perez even bragged to his clients. Everyone's getting hit, except my customers. He left out the part where he was behind most of the hits, but like any weapon, Mirai started reaching beyond its original target. They tested it on security blogs, hosting providers, telecom infrastructure, and every time, it worked. Mirai had become something more than a tool for winning game server turf wars. It was now a full-blown cyber weapon, and no one saw it coming. Because no one was looking at Wi-Fi cameras. No one thought baby monitors could be dangerous. No one imagined a home DVR could be hijacked. But now, they weren't just dangerous. They were part of something bigger. And they were being trained for war. 
late 2016. Mirai was already infamous. It had knocked major sites offline, flooded networks with junk traffic, and exposed how fragile the internet really was. But Perez, Josiah, and Dalton were starting to feel the heat. Journalists were digging. Security researchers were closing in. Law enforcement had taken notice. So the boys made a move, a strange one. They didn't delete Mirai. They didn't hide it. They released it. September 30th, 2016. A user named Anna Senpai posted to the hacking forum, Hack Forums. They shared the full source code of Mirai, open, raw, and ready to use. No encryption, no redactions, just here, take it. At first, it looked like an act of defiance, or maybe arrogance, but it wasn't either. It was a smokescreen. By leaking the code, Paris hoped to create confusion. If dozens of people were running Mirai, it would be harder to trace the original back to them. It was cyber misdirection, and it worked. In the days that followed, copies of the code began circulating across Telegram groups, dark web forums, and even GitHub. And what happened next was something no one could control. The leak gave birth to clones, dozens of them. Some attackers changed the signature, others added new capabilities. They turned Mirai from a tool into a framework, a modular botnet engine anyone could customize. Variants began to appear within weeks. Some used Mirai to target home users. Others went after banks. A few turned their sights on industrial systems. Each new variant had a new purpose, but the same DNA. Mirai's genius and its danger wasn't just in its size. It was in how easy it was to use. You didn't need to be a world-class hacker. You didn't need custom exploits or zero days. All you needed was a server, the leaked code and a list of IPs with factory default credentials. In a matter of hours, you could have a botnet of your own. It was plug-and-play cyber warfare, and the targets were endless. Unpatched routers, cheap IP cameras, legacy modems, millions of devices. Always on, always vulnerable. No antivirus, no user alerts, no oversight. Just silent recruits waiting to be claimed. Security researchers began noticing strange patterns new waves of infections, new command and control nodes, new targets being hit, some in new countries. But the code was all too familiar. Same scanning behavior, same username password brute force attempts, same flood types. Only now, there wasn't one Mirai. There were dozens, each controlled by someone else, each with its own objectives. One moment, it was a tool for extortion. The next, it was a weapon in a turf war between cyber gangs. A week later, it was being used by a nation state. Mirai had become open source chaos, a cyber gun left on a park bench, and everyone was picking it up. The internet had just changed. The age of handcrafted malware was giving way to something else, commodity botnets. You didn't need to build a weapon anymore. Someone had already leaked it. You just needed to aim it. And Mirai? It was now loaded in the arsenal of amateurs, criminals, and adversarial governments. October 21st, 2016, three weeks after the Mirai source code leaked, something strange started happening across the internet. It began on the east coast of the United States. Users couldn't access Twitter, then Reddit, then Spotify, PayPal, Netflix, the New York Times. Within an hour, the outage had spread across Europe. By noon, it was global. It wasn't a hack. No one breached the servers. They just became unreachable. The attacker had aimed Mirai at a single point of failure, DIN. A major DNS provider, the system that tells your browser where to go when you type in a website. Take down DIN, and you take down a big chunk of the internet. And that's exactly what happened. The attack peaked at 1.2 terabits per second, the largest DDoS attack in recorded history at that point. It came from over 100,000 devices, mostly cameras, routers, DVRs, many of them infected with Mirai variants that had evolved from the leaked code. DIN went dark, and with it, so did the sites it powered. The fallout was immediate. Companies lost millions, users lost trust, and governments started asking questions. Who launched the DIN attack? Was it the original creators of Mirai or someone else? The answer remains unclear. Several cyber criminal groups claimed responsibility. None provided proof. Some experts believe it was a test, 
a show of power by a nation state. Others think it was chaos for its own sake. What's clear is this. The Din attack marked a turning point. The moment when everyone, from Silicon Valley to Capitol Hill, realized just how vulnerable the internet really was. But Din was just the beginning. Over the next year, Mirai and its variants were used in attacks around the globe. November 2016. A large telecom provider in Liberia was hit with a Mirai-powered DDoS. It brought nearly the entire country's internet to a halt. The suspected source? A Mirai variant run by a lone actor known online as Best Buy, not connected to Paris and the others. This was what made Mirai so dangerous. Anyone could use it to silence journalists, extort businesses, disrupt infrastructure. 2017, universities began noticing problems, campus networks slowing, weird traffic spikes, unexplained outages. Rutgers University was hit repeatedly. One attack lasted for days, paralyzing class registration, email, even security systems. When investigators looked deeper, they found traces of Mirai. The motive? Disruption. Maybe revenge. Maybe a student trying to delay finals. With Mirai, you didn't need a nation-state budget to cause real damage. You just needed the code. 2018. A new wave of Mirai clones appeared. Not just for DDoS, but for crypto mining. Instead of flooding sites with traffic, they used infected devices to mine digital currency. Your router could be making someone else money, without you ever knowing. Then came the geopolitics. In 2020, a Mirai variant called Mosey infected over 1.5 million devices worldwide. It was traced back to infrastructure in China. And while its creators were allegedly caught, the botnet lingered, living in unpatched devices, waiting for commands. Analysts began to see a pattern. State-aligned actors were quietly adopting tools that had once been the domain of teenagers. Iran, North Korea, Russia, each suspected of using or modifying Mirai-based tools. The same code base that started with Minecraft Wars was now fueling global cyber conflict. And through it all, the devices stayed infected. Routers in apartments, cameras in small businesses, smart TVs in hotel lobbies. Few were ever cleaned. Most would never be patched. Because the average user, they didn't even know they were part of a botnet. Mirai had done something few cyber weapons ever could. It became permanent, a background threat, a structural weakness in the global internet, and all of it. Every terabit of traffic, every outage, every blackout came from a script written by three kids in a dorm. Winter 2016. Mirai had gone global. The DIN attack was international news. Security firms were tracing the botnet's fingerprints across every sector and behind the scenes. The walls were closing in. The FBI had launched an investigation. Subpoenas were flying. Internet infrastructure providers were handing over logs. And slowly, the digital trail narrowed. It pointed back to three people, three IPs, three kids. They had built it together, grown it, and now, they were about to answer for it. In December 2017, all three were formally charged in federal court. Computer fraud. Conspiracy to violate the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Operating a botnet. The charges detailed not just the creation of Mirai, but its use for financial gain. Crashing Minecraft servers, extorting companies, selling access to the botnet. Mirai wasn't just a weapon, it had become a business. The boys pled guilty. But what happened next surprised everyone. They weren't sent to prison. Instead, the court made a decision. They would cooperate. Perez, Josiah, and Dalton were sentenced to five years probation, 2,500 hours of community service, and had to pay restitution. But more importantly, they agreed to work with the FBI to help dismantle botnets, analyze malware, and close the very security holes they once exploited, from attackers to allies. It wasn't redemption, not fully, but it was a start. In the years that followed, Mirai never truly died. Its variants kept multiplying, new exploits added, new devices compromised. Even as late as 2022, governments were issuing advisories about Mirai-based threats. Hospitals, airports, power grids, still vulnerable to code written six years earlier. And the creators, they faded from view. 
Para's jaw got a job in cybersecurity. Josiah and Dalton disappeared from headlines, but their fingerprints remain in every outdated router, every attack that begins with a flood of traffic and ends with silence. Because that's the legacy of Mirai, not just the damage it caused, but the blueprint it left behind. It showed how fragile the internet really is, how easy it is to weaponize everyday tech, and how a few lines of code can ripple across the world. Not because of who wrote it, but because of who picked it up. The internet is still vulnerable, still sprawling, still filled with unsecured devices, all connected, all exposed. And Mirai is still out there, in code bases, in forks, in memory. The kids who started it have moved on, but the system they broke, it never really recovered. So the question is, what's out there now? And when it wakes up, will we see it coming?